my target audience often in my medical practice is kind of the middle-aged guy who hasn't had the heart attack but is starting to wonder about why is he here what's it all about is his body deteriorating and his health deteriorating and that that focus on purpose and drive is starting to diminish and that's a very high risk guy they need to actively tend to their friendships and to their relationships and to their sense of meaning and purpose. We've got to um, you know, get them focusing on mind health and brain health. Brain function is linked to things like heart function, cardiac function. So if someone, one of every six people gets depression in their lifetime, major depressive disorder. If one has an acute coronary event, a heart attack, one of three is the risk. And the odds of dying if you're simultaneously depressed following a heart attack are several fold greater. Those two things don't work well together, now why? We're just starting to understand that maybe it's even some of the same pathology. Inflammation down here isn't good, inflammation up here isn't good. We're learning that there are new modalities for us to intervene in people who have depressions, bipolar illnesses, inflammatory depression is becoming a huge research topic. This is a key area that's put us back together. It's all one giant artery system, so if uh, a person's prone to heart disease and has had a bypass or a stent or a balloon or uh, known they have blockages, um, they're likely suffering some impaired blood flow to their brain and they're going to be more susceptible to dementia particularly but also depression. There's no question that blood flow to the brain is reduced when there's also heart disease. One of the consequences is depression rates go up a lot after a heart attack. But the double whammy of a recent heart attack and depression is a very ominous combination and it's been shown clearly that people that have had a heart attack that are either socially isolated, have you know, little extended family, little friendship, little collegiality at work, or people that develop clinical depression after a heart attack are at a much, much higher risk path for early death and recurrent heart attack than those that have the full support. We're learning how critical the health of the GI tract, what we call the gut or gut health, if you want the fancy word, the microbiome, these trillion of bacteria that are living predominantly in our colon, that they are an organism that almost controls us and when that mixture of bacteria isn't optimal and health, healthful, it affects our heart health is really new data that's amazing. And in the last five years, it's very clear it also affects your brain health. Anxiety can be treated with probiotics. Heart disease can be treated with probiotics. It's radical new stuff, but you have to view your GI tract as kind of the soil and the roots of a giant tree. The tree is your body but what you're taking in through the GI tract and exposure to antibiotics and foods or antibiotics for therapy, chemicals in our water, our air, and our drinks, uh, our American diet that was just reanalyzed in the past week or two and it's still 60 to 65% junk food for the average American. Junk food makes junk heart, makes junk brain, no question about it. Back in about 2010, 2011, I've kind of had enough of feeling bad and I wasn't sure if this was just how I was going to feel for the rest of my life. I just felt in my heart like I, there's got to be other options out there. You know, I'm still depressed. I'm on two antidepressants. I'm in excruciating pain. I'm on a plethora of narcotics. I'm on every other pill you can imagine to compensate for that one, to push that one more, to make that one work better. You know, after I sat and counted 23 pills in my hand for a whole entire day, I'm like, there's gotta be something different. So I met with um, numerous doctors. How do we do this? How can I get off of it? So I went through a good week or so of, of a detox and I wanted to pull my hair out. I wanted to scream, I wanted to die. I mean, it was just like, the feeling is, is I can't even explain to you how bad going through withdrawal feels. And, um, before I left there, I, I could actually say that I was clean. I was off of everything. I've dealt with the pain, I've dealt with the aches. I've kind of gotten through all of that, but um, I've never felt more human 
and back to myself than, than I do today, being off of all that medication. Let's study places where people are active and their brain works and they have friends and they have smiles on their face and they're dancing. If anybody saw Dick Van Dyke at age 91 just a few weeks ago at a Disney festival on TV dancing to Mary Poppins songs, I mean, who wouldn't want to be 91 and be able to move like that? That's what Blue Zones studied and it's all about lifestyle and these five zones don't have identical lifestyles. Eating real food, always rich in fruits and vegetables, actually beans were the most common food across the five blue zones, eating foods that are rich in beans, high in fiber, high in nutrition, excellent for cholesterol control, blood sugar control. Beans are a universal sign of a healthy diet and longevity. I mean, that's critical. There's, there, you know, so the blue zones go beyond diet. They go to socialization. Um, they go to um, a joy in life, drinking a little wine here and there. There's so much information that we've learned from the Blue Zones project that it's motivated some doctors to actually go and visit these regions learn what they're doing and bring it back to enhance their practice and their education. We have a weight loss specialist, a metabolic specialist in Detroit, Tom Rafai, a very good friend of mine, medical doctor, who actually traveled to Sardinia and stayed with the people and walked through their gardens and saw how they lived to bring back and teach that firsthand. I want to take a moment to talk about eating a variety and eating your colors. And we're not talking about your M&Ms, guys, okay? We're talking about a variety of fruits and vegetables. When you eat a variety of colors, red, green, yellow, orange, you're gonna get the vitamins and minerals you need. Manja. Anything we can do to reduce stress hormones makes us healthier and has us live longer. That's one of the reasons why when you go out and exercise and you jog and you exercise, you're increasing your cortisol levels in a very natural way. You're getting rid of the stress in your mind often and in your brain because your body is becoming physically fatigued. And that reduces adrenaline and noradrenaline release from the adrenal gland. And that's one reason why exercise works. It's not just an increase in aerobic activity, it's the relationship relationship that exercise has to all the stress hormones that are produced in our adrenal gland. In an analogous fashion, meditation, contemplative, uh, contemplative uh, practices also reduce stress hormones and that's why they improve the quality of life and that's why there's reasonable evidence to say that they also produce quantity of life and longevity too. You know, physical activity is something I would view um, as, as just a, a general palliative factor um, across the board you know we're not really you don't even need to focus really on suicidal behavior on mental disorders we're just talking about any health related thing um, there are a few things that I think people should do pretty much every day if they just want to have better health including better mental health and one is physical activity and it's just real essential to understand what I mean by that I'm not talking about marathon runners or any, any such thing I'm talking about 10 15 minutes a day of walking Something like that. And most people can, can get some form of that physical activity and it's worth doing. It just really adds up. If you do it outside, uh, that way, especially in the morning, you get exposure to morning light. Uh, morning sunlight is an active antidepressant. And so that, that just kind of combines two things that are healthy activity and morning sunlight. If you do it with other people, then you've got three things going. You've got social connection, activity, and morning sunlight. And then if you do it in a, in a natural setting where there's some, some uh, of nature around, whether it be hiking, whether it be gardening, uh, whether it be plant, you know, walking with the dogs, any aspect of connection to nature is something that's just clearly healthful. And so if people can manage to get activities that come out of all those things physical activity, morning light, interactions with nature, and social connection. That, that goes a long way to, to good health.